first, I just want to um, say thank you to Maine Youth for Climate Justice, to 350 Maine, the Sierra Club Maine chapter, and the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance for working to organize this event. And I also want to thank our speakers, uh, Melissa Ferretti and Lakota Sanborn, for joining us to speak tonight. We're also going to be sharing a video from Carlton Richards, who's a youth from a Cree First Nations community in Canada, who's not able to join us live, um, but has sent us a video of frontline voices to share. Okay, so my name um, is Julia St. Clair. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from South Portland, Maine tonight on Wabanaki land. I work with Maine Youth for Climate Justice. We're a coalition of over 300 youth and over 20 youth led organizations from across the state that are working on climate justice issues. And I also work with 350 Maine, which is a grassroots environmental organization focused on tackling the climate crisis. And I am really passionately opposed to the CMP corridor and the use of Canadian hydropower. And I'm sure many folks here tonight have already heard about the CMP corridor, but I'm gonna talk about some of the, the work that our organizations have been doing and why this is such an intersectional issue and critical issue within the context of climate justice. Okay. So Central Maine Power, um, referred to as CMP, is building a 145 mile above ground energy transmission line. Um, this is known as the CMP corridor. It's also called the New England Clean Energy Connect project. And this is going through Western Maine to bring um, hydropower from Quebec, Canada to consumers in Massachusetts. So this project will not be creating any new renewable energy. Um, it's just going to be selling existing energy to Massachusetts and using Maine essentially as an extension cord. And in doing so, CMP is clearing a path through Maine's western forest, which though parts of this area are working forest, this corridor is going to permanently alter what is considered to be one of the largest tracts of contigu contiguous temperate forest in the world. And this permanent tree clearing is going to have negative impacts on wildlife movement, waterways, wetlands, specifically going to threaten brook trout and other um, endangered and threatened species. And there's a lot of concern that this damage to the forest will have an impact on the tourism and recreation economies in Western Maine, which also rely on the natural resources in this area. So currently CMP has received all the necessary state and federal permits to proceed with the project and construction has already started. But tonight we're going to talk about this project, about hydropower and how it complicates the ways in which we discuss renewable energy as we consider the full impacts of this corridor and Hydro-Quebec's hydroelectric dams. Okay. So I just wanna talk a little bit to highlight the opposition that currently exists to the corridor. Um, in 2019, polling found that 65% of Mainers oppose this project. Um, there's also 25 towns along the corridor which either oppose or have rescinded their support for this project. And I also want to note that CMP has been rated, um, Central Maine Power has been rated as one of the worst utility companies in America. So Mainers across demographics and across the political spectrum oppose this project and have expressed their frustrations. And additionally, the Penobscot Nation here in Maine, the Heron Pond, Wampanoag Tribe in Massachusetts have also stated their opposition as well as the Inu First Nation in Canada. So this opposition is widespread um, and folks have been very outspoken since the initial proposal of this project. Okay. So just to highlight some of the reasons why we oppose this project, um, one of which are conservation concerns. So as I mentioned, folks want to protect this track of forest. It's the largest east of the Mississippi that is contiguous. Um, there are wildlife concerns, there's native species concerns. So conservation has been um, a key reason why a lot of environmental organizations have opposed this project. Another concern is recreation. So protecting this land for recreation purposes, outdoors use, this is a huge part of Maine's economy. Um, and so folks who rely on this part of Maine's economy have been really concerned about the impacts that'll, that this will have on Maine's outdoor economy. Another concern is public lands. 
So this corridor does cut through a section um, of public lands. And this has been offered up for use without the public input. Um, technically in Maine, it is required that two thirds majority of Maine's Congress vote to approve any use of public lands um, for these purposes. And this was not done. So thinking beyond Maine's borders, um, there needs to be a stronger focus on local solutions for renewable energy. So we need to be focusing on energy generation within our regions, so within our state, um, within our towns, within our own countries, and focusing on clean and renewable sources that also are just, rather than allowing large corporations to make these decisions. We also need to be thinking about the climate impacts. So big hydro power dams may actually not reduce carbon emissions. Um, when you think about the, the land that is flooded um, to build a dam, a lot of carbon is emitted in that process. So we actually need to think about how we're going to reduce demand for energy from big hydro dams. And finally, and one of the most important things that I think is the environmental and climate justice issue in thinking about the impacts on First Nations communities. So these dams um, in Canada, where this hydropower is coming from, are on First Nations land um, and have flooded First Nations land. And um, so we need to be talking about what the environmental justice concerns are, not just focusing on what it means for energy to be renewable. Okay. So just to give everyone a little bit of perspective um, about what I'm talking about when we say a mega dam or what we're talking about with um, hydropower coming from Quebec and coming from Hydro-Quebec, um, this video just gives a little bit of perspective of how large these dams actually are um, and the amount of land that is flooded in that process. So in Maine, I think the focus around the conversation with the CMP corridor has been really narrow. Um, it's highlighted the impacts that will be directly on people in the state, but not thought beyond the borders. So I think it's really important that we're here tonight having this conversation to give that big of, bit of insight. So as you can see from this dam, um, it's super destructive to think about the amount of land that is flooded um, for this energy to be produced. And I think, you know, here in New England, maybe we don't have a good conception of what this actually looks like, what a dam this massive um, actually does to the land around it. So Hydro-Quebec's dams impact the Inuit Nation in Canada. Um, and so, as I said, this is really a environmental justice concern and also a concern for indigenous sovereignty when we think about the specific impacts on indigenous community um, throughout Canada. And so I think, um, yeah, thank you for, for taking a look at this video. Okay. So I think to, to continue sort of beyond um, Maine's borders, this project was originally proposed to go through New Hampshire. Um, this, their proposal was rejected. Um, and so Maine became the sort of second option. Vermont also was a proposed location so this was all because Massachusetts has been pushing for more renewable energy, but again, without looking at what the impacts will be outside of their state's boundaries. So Massachusetts has worked really hard to frame this project as clean, green, and renewable, and not thinking about that larger impact. Ah, and then, ah, ah, bless you, and just please everyone, if you can make sure you're muted, thank you. Um, so on to the next slide, sorry. <laughs> so also just to sort of address some of the, the current opposition um, that's been ongoing, there have been several lawsuits that have been targeting the permits that have been issued for this project, as well as the public land usage. I know that Sierra Club, the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Natural Resources Council of Maine have all been involved. Um, in these sort of legal lawsuits. And there's also been legal opposition in Canada on the other side of the border. Um, also in Maine, there's been legislation in the current session um, that were put, uh, bills that were put forward um, to all to sort of bring a halt to this project. And there's also been a slew of legislative solutions in Maine thinking about how we can better regionally source um, our renewable energy. 
And finally, in Maine, um, there's also been a referendum question that will be on the upcoming ballot that directly focuses on um, trying to reject this corridor project. I think additionally, uh, folks throughout Maine, Massachusetts, and Canada have been very outspoken, both in local news and also writing directly to political bodies, um, calling on the Army Corps for en and of Engineers to conduct an environmental impact statement, for example, or contacting representatives to state their opposition to this project. Okay. Uh, so here we're going to share um, this video that was shared for a with us from Carlton Richard Richards. Um, this video features him and other frontline voices from First Nations communities. Uh, as I mentioned, Carlton Richards was not able to join us tonight because they're not in an area with um, strong enough Wi-Fi signal. But Carlton is a youth from a Cree First Nations community in Canada where hydropower development by Manitoba Hydro has destroyed rivers, streams, and forests. And so they've shared this video um, with frontline voices. And I think we're gonna start streaming that now. Each year, Northeastern governors in the United States and Eastern Canadian premiers meet at the Coalition of Northeastern Governors Conference, or CONEG, to cooperate on economic, social, and environmental issues. These include discussions on energy policy that would tether the United States to Canadian hydroelectricity for the next 40 to 60 years, hydropower that poisons waters, destroys carbon sequestering forests and fragile ecosystems, and contributes to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. We demand a voice at Carnac. Manitoba Hydro claims they self-clean energy. As you can see this rock, this is the water level, the, that the debris that is caused by Manitoba Hydro. children swim, our people, where they hunt, fish, and trap. What are we going to do about this? We've petitioned, actually, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to, um, to hold an environment, uh, prepare an environmental impact statement uh, to accompany the project. Uh, we've been abruptly denied that request, um, and and are currently seeking um, uh, consultation uh, with the tribe under the uh, Army Corps' uh, Indian consultation policy. They reverse our water flow, so our water flow doesn't flow naturally <clears throat> as it should be. Nothing. They said they were going to fluctuate the water the height of a pencil. But the waters have been going up so high, they've been going as high as eight feet, sometimes 12 in some places. You know, it's really expensive to buy food from the store, so we have to go out, hunt, trap, and fish for our foods. Our waters are not safe to swim in. We can't even drink it. I've seen um, my ancestors' graves wash out, which uh, we had to report. And then with, within about a couple of days, we had to do a reburial. Uh, ceremonial reburial. But this is what the Americans, the United States, feed on. Our way of life has devastated, altered our hunting, fishing, trapping, our seasonal uh, migration in the spring and uh, in the fall. We can't do anymore. Because this thing flucked, these, these turbines there are open, can open any time. So we've been traveling back and forth between New York and Boston and other cities in, in between here, uh, just delivering the message that the um, hydro energy that the people buying from uh, Canada is not really clean, yeah. uh, it's not green. Is basically creating a, a very terrible uh, 
human people living there in their uh, traditional lands for thousands of years completely disappeared uh, because of the flooding of the hydro dams. Well, what can the people of the United States do to help is they have to talk to people who have suffered, who have lived in that kind of life situation that's very devastating. The environment being destroyed, our food web being destroyed, our economy being destroyed, our lives have been destroyed, our emotions, our mental, our spiritual, our mind, and everything has been. It, it, it affects us in so many different ways. And I did it. it's so devastating that we are disconnected from the beautiful land that we have had in the past. As a tribal nation, it is our responsibility to protect and defend our inherent rights to self-determination. We are focused on ensuring a strong future for our tribal citizens. And that requires that we protect the land, the water, and all of our relatives, human and non-human. We call upon you, the Coalition of Northeastern Governors, to acknowledge and adhere to these inherent rights. I was drunk, Thomas. What is your So again, that video was shared um, to us by Carlton Richards. And I'm now, if we can hop back on the slides, I'm gonna introduce our two speakers who are here tonight. Um, our first speaker is Melissa Harding Ferretti, a member of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe and its elected chairwoman and president. She works to preserve the tribe's cultural heritage and land rights, and is also the president of the Wampanoag Language Recl Reclamation Project and serves on many lo local state boards and organizations. Um, speaking after Melissa will be Lakota Sanborn, who's a Penobscot artist and advocate dedicated to indigenous liberation and empowerment. He's a member of the Sunlight Media Collective, an organization working to document and produce stories affecting Wabanaki people and the intersections of environmental issues and tribal rights. Lakota has a background in political organizing and community building. He's a member of Racial Equity and Justice and the Needle Point Sanctuary. He's also a founding member of the Bomazin Land Trust, a Wabanaki-led 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to rematriation, food sovereignty, and Wabanaki cultural transmission. So I'm going to hand it over um, to Melissa to, to speak with us. Melissa uh, Ferretti. Nutomas, Sikwana Makopaklet, Kanatai, Tuxit, Borndale Ut. What I've said to you in my beloved language is good evening, good day. Uh, I am called, my name is Melissa Ferretti. I am from the Herring Pond, Wampanoag tribe of Plymouth and Borndale. So um, I'm really honored to be here. And uh, as I said before, those of you who I've been uh, so fortunate to share a space with previously uh, may have heard some of these words previously that I that I'm going to say tonight. But um, I, I feel that you know it's the message that we really want to send. And being raised by an elder of my tribe, just watching that video back, you know, really brings some emotion to mind. And I, I think about how how less of our, our hunting in our, our fishing areas we have left now. So I'm gonna go on to my speech and then I can add a little bit, but so, you know, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe and other indigenous communities, we all remain deeply connected culturally and spiritually to our homelands and to the waters that our people continue to fish, hunt, trap and gather on. These spiritual, close spiritual and cultural ties to our homelands along with our hunting territory remain as strong as ever, even though they're seriously depleted. As indigenous people, we stand together with those like all of you here with like concerns to protect 
the homelands that we all live on and the waters that sustain us. Today, our tribal community continues this work of our ancestors to protect the land, the water for our youth and the future generations. As I speak to you today, indigenous people and tribal communities throughout North America, as we all know well, remain on the front line of these efforts to address climate change and to oppose these projects that will be destructive to the natural world, our mother earth. For our tribe and for all other tribal nations, as I said previously in the video, our self-determination as people, as a people depends on fulfilling our responsibility to protect our youth, our elders, and to protect all of our relatives, human and non-human, right? Most importantly, we know that we have a primary responsibility to our tribal youth to ensure that they and their children inherit a planet that we, that has been nurtured by us. In my work as tribal chairwoman, I am inspired by the many indigenous activists, educators, leaders, and non-native alike who are bringing broader public attention to these environmental issues. We know that the homeland of tribal nations in the United States are among the first communities that are most likely to be targeted for projects that are disastrous for the environment and that have multiple destructive impacts on indigenous people's lives. Tar sands, pipelines, transmission corridors, waste dumping, resource extraction, sand and gravel, all of those things, solar on our lands. We know that all of these environmental justices and threats, injustices and threats uh, to our community and the well being faced by other indigenous communities whose homelands and sacred places are ravaged by dams, flooding, transmission corridors, or pipelines. These are environmental justices and threats to the well being that we may face in the near future. Massachusetts, here. We've known this because we have been at the ground zero of colonial resource extraction for 400 years. And I know well, people, indigenous people in New England are overlooked, often ignored when it comes to these matters of energy and resource development. Yet at the same time, and I've said this over and over again, as a tribe whose ancestral homeland, along with our forest, fish, and all of our wildlife in Plymouth, was used by the pilgrims to serve their interests as colonists. We and our history as a tribe are directly connected to these decisions that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts makes about these projects, such as this transmission corridor that's proposed by Hydro Quebec, Quebec Central Maine Power and others. So raised by an elder of my tribe, as I mentioned, Verna May Harding, she was born in 1905. And Verna was born on the Herring Pond Bumpnog Reservation lands, what is known to known today as the Valley and Borndale and Cedarville, which is in South Plymouth, Massachusetts. So as a child, we were taught the ways of our ancestors. Verna taught me the ways of our ancestors to fish, to hunt, to gather, to trap, and to appreciate the land and the water for all that it provides us for sustenance and survival. Verna, like many of our elder elders that have crossed over, were traditional knowledge keepers and practitioners. She and they, many of them speak of these stories now, they relied heavily on the land to sustain our families. She, like many others, was an avid angler. She was always fishing. She loved hunting. She prepared game at, at the dinner table. And half my childhood growing up, I can remember Verna sitting at the picnic table cutting fish. How important is that? And it was what she referred to when we were small children as living off the fat of the land is what she would say. And she would rant and rave about how important that was. She, like all of the other tribal members, loved tending her garden. She canned all the preserves, nothing went to waste. She would always share her bounty with the community as well. Non-native or native, if 
somebody in our community was in need, Verna was certainly going to help them. We, she, was also, she was very proud, she was generous, and although she had very little, she would share with those who were less fortunate. And imagine how devastating it, it was for her and all of our other tribal community members who now have many of them have passed to watch the land destroyed over and over again or land taken for tax reasons or other purposes and to put cranberry bogs or to build a, a, a mall or, or something else on our lands and where we would be previously used for sustenance and food. So as we have made clear, the Herring Pond Wampanoag type, we've made clear we're not opposed to renewable energy. We're always looking for effective climate solutions and our very existence is built on sustainability. But we are in opposition of any greenwashed projects that are disastrous for the environment, threaten our water supply, our homelands and our habitat. This rich habitat that all our tribal nations so love. All indigenous people love the land. They love the land, they belong to the land. And it remains profoundly important to the well being of all of our people, right? As you may know, in 2019, I think we spoke of this earlier, the Heron Pond Wampanoag tribe, uh, we issued a statement of, of solidarity. And we're, and we're very proud that we stood with our sisters and brothers of the Penobscot and the Indian nations in rejecting this dangerous hydroelectric projects that de directly impact not only their food sources and their, their sustainability, but their human rights as First Nations and tribal communities in Canada and the United States. We're proud to stand with our brothers and sisters of all tribal nations and indigenous communities in inserting the right to protect ourselves and all of our relatives and relations against environmental destruction, including these proposed projects, this corridor that might come through right through to Massachusetts. Our human rights are, are at risk here. We know that we as indigenous people have this human right. The UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states that endorsed by the State Department in 2010. We have a right to good faith consultation and cooperation about matters that impact our lands, our communities and our future. To us, the land, the water and all wildlife with whom we exist are sacred. In closing, I'm just gonna briefly share a little bit of an article I, I had read previously uh, by Amy Dickens, it, it was titled, Indigenous Peoples Bear the Brunt of Global Greenwash. She begins, and we know this well, as evermore companies and governments pledge to go green and protect the forests, the world's tribal peoples should be among the, men, the main beneficiaries, writes Amy. Yet the reverse is the case. All too often, the promises are the purest greenwash, in my case, could be here in Massachusetts, used to conceal the human environmental tragedy in land grabbing for plantations, mines, logging, and even, they say, conservation. It's evident the greenwashing is evolving, right? It's not getting better. And with that, the challenge that tribal people face as conservation and development organizations collaborate with irresponsible corporations, the distinction between protector and perpetrator becomes blurred. So in closing, you know, some may say, you know, you're in Massachusetts, you're in Plymouth, why are you here to talk about what's going on in Maine? Well, my father who retired, he's, he, he grew up, he was born in the Valley here in the Herring Pond Wampanoag homeland, but he retired up in Dexter, Maine. And he now lives there. So it's important to us. Some of our people could be in that region. And it's just as important to us here to protect and to, to speak out for our brothers and sisters and the other in, in, in the, from the Penobscot and all the other tribal nations. So it's important to me anywhere in the United States. So thank you for listening. And I really appreciate sharing this space with all of you. And I look forward to hearing my fellow panelists and Thanks so much.
Thank you, Melissa. I'm going to pass it over to Lakota. Koikwe, Kachi Waliwani, Pakunokwaziak, Diliwizi, Nujiao, on the Bayi Manahan, Nia Banawapskawi, Dolbe Wagodam. Hello. It's uh, it's really great to see all of you today. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Melissa, for, for your presentation and your speech. Um, yeah, there's a few things that I wanted to touch on. We don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to run run through some things that have been floating around in my head for the past few weeks. Um, and one of which I feel like is really central to this whole thing is that um, mega dams and dams in general have historically been used as tools, um, not only for you know resource control, but also as control over indigenous populations as well. Um, in many instances, you know, dams were erected in very specific locations um, in order to curb the food supplies of native peoples. Um, these dams, in many ways, disrupted uh, transportation to hunting grounds. Um, and, you know, they were really strategic in that, you know, these, these, these rivers here in Maine were our main source of transportation between the different tribal communities. And when you block the rivers and, you know, flood different areas and make it so it's harder to cross, it's harder to um, meet diplomatically with other nations to tell them about what's going on and, and the encroaching that's happening. And so, um, you know, the loss of habitat in the sacred spaces due to flooding is just another element of that as well, um, that this this whole this whole thing around dams and mega dams like it, it has historical precedent right and so what we have seen here in Maine um, back in the early um, 1800s actually in 1801 the petition was was made for um, by the Penobscot Nation to the Commonwealth of, of uh, Massachusetts that was against the building of a mill and dam uh, just below what's quoted as within gunshots range of, of our reservation. And that dam is still there today. Um, people for, you know, over the course of the next 40 years, we're talking about how devastating it was to the fish populations and how um, we didn't have the means to, to feed our communities anymore because of these dams that were going up. Um, we pleaded with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but consistently our, our rights were denied. And if, if you can imagine, you know, the impact of that with people who are riverine, who rely on the rivers and rely on the waterways for food and travel, um, these things going up really severed a lot of, of our abilities to thrive as peoples, which we have been doing for tens of thousands of years here in this region. Um, you know, currently that, that corridor that is going through Western Maine, that is in a space where there were many tribal communities who once lived there, but as the course of uh, colonialism was was uh, continuing, a lot of those folks were massacred or fled to um, different areas of neighboring communities or up into Quebec um, and formed communities there as a means of escape. And a lot of those folks who fled from those regions traveled a route that is actually basically true true to the map, um, the route that the CMP corridor is going through. And the fact of the matter is that we don't have enough information about the, um, you know, the artifacts or the sacred sites, um, that being a, a really well-known traveling route from uh, Quebec down to this region. Um, there, there could be any number of things along, along that area that could never get, be returned um, once they're, you know, destroyed with the, the cutting of these forests. Um, yeah, I, it, was, it was brought up earlier and I really wanna just touch on that, that uh, my, my cousin said this earlier today to me that this, this project is being carried out. This is like the largest developmental project in Maine and it's being conducted by a company that has the worst in the nation customer satisfaction for three consecutive years, CMP. Um, and yeah, last, last year, Penobscot Nation uh, put out that letter, uh, as you heard our chief Kirk Francis say in that video, um, where we stood in solidarity and we still stand in solidarity with our Innu um, brothers and sisters and our Wampanoag brothers and sisters in, in being in opposition to this. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that when we're talking about green energy and thinking about our futures as, you know, 
as our futures as a species on, a, on this planet, but also as protectors of other forms of life on this planet, that you know we we need to be really aware of greenwashing and the the reason why these kind of things happen. Um, you know, when our when our basic model for as a society for economic development is based on imperialism and is based on land theft and destruction and extraction, um, you know, these things are going to keep happening, you know, as, as we're seeing a transition from fossil fuels into green energy, into, um, to lithium, uh, batteries for electric cars or for solar panels, what we're going to see then is, is this model of imperialism, this mindset behind it, that's been driving fossil fuels. They're just going to change that out for, um, you know, green energy products. So the same exact mindset that went into getting us to this position where we are in dire straits is going to be utilized to push for lithium mining in indigenous territories. Um, things like mega dams are going to continue to, to happen in, in our territories. Um, you know, there's, there's ways that these things need to be done um, in order to, to protect us, right, as a species. And as Melissa said, like we, we as a nation too, and, and I as an individual, I'm fully supportive of renewable resources, um, but they can't be done in this way where it's literally just a money-making scheme where the environmental impacts of, you know, the flooding of that, that was 2,200 square miles of a new territory. It's 2,200 square miles is how big that reservoir is. The amount of carbon that was released in that, I, I don't even, I, I can't even comprehend the amount of, of carbon that was stored in those trees that is just not there anymore. And, you know, the, the thing that we keep seeing, and, and this is uh, the case on the Kennebec River here in the state of Maine, um, where there are four, four dams in the Kennebec that are Canadian owned, right? Um, the, I think the name of the company is Brookfield Renewables. Um, and currently we, we were in uh, attempts to get those four dams removed because the, the power that they are generating is very negligible. Um, compared to the environmental destruction that is being waged against uh, spawning fish and uh, specifically also Atlantic salmon, who are a keystone species in the region, um, they are at the brink of extinction because of these dams and the inability to spawn in these grounds that they've been spawning in for thousands of years. And so what you see often is, is these transnational projects uh, between the U.S. and Canada are so easily approved, yet anytime we try to um, go through the proper means and, and their proper channels in order to challenge these things, it's so much more difficult for us. Um, it, when, when we petition the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, it's like we're, we're petitioning an American-based uh, entity to go across the border and study the impacts in Canada. And they can easily say no because of the border. So, you know, it, it really needs to be addressed um, first and foremost, why it's so easy for these developmental projects to span entire uh, continents basically, while our ability as a people to um, study the, even just to study the impacts of those things are so limited. Um, yeah, and I, I don't have too much more that I, uh, I don't want to take up too much space here. Um, and it, speaking to uh, Inu, and I, I really wish that some folks from Inu Nation could be here to, you know, discuss the impacts that have happened directly to their people. Um, even just watching that video is filled with a real deep sadness. Um, even here, even here in the state of Maine, we've we've, you know, been dealing with the theft of our river, which the the state of Maine has, you know, illegally, without any sort of transactional approach, without any sort of signing of treaties, the state of Maine has effectively um, been working to steal the river from us as a people. And my heart aches just thinking about what the people in Inu are going through and how something like that could easily have happened here or happen here in the future with the state of Maine attempting to steal the river. And as these green energy futures are being imagined. Um, and so I really just want to 
you know, have a brief moment of, of silence for, for Inu. Um, and just considering, you know, what, what they're going through. And yeah, so I just want to take a, a minute for that and then I'll, I'll say a closing. So if folks could join me in just a moment of silence. So green energy products uh, and projects rather are, are a must for the future of our species on the planet, but also for the continuation of so many other species. Um, but more importantly than that is the intent and the mindset of how we approach green energy and how we approach renewable energy projects as a whole, um, any kind of developmental projects, right? Important questions to consider are whose land are the projects being carried out on? Are the indigenous peoples there fully consenting to the project? Are indigenous people not only a consideration in the process, but actual leaders at the table with the power to make the decisions required? Are native people benefiting equally from the projects as non-natives are? Are treaty rights being upheld or are unceded lands being seized illegally? Ultimately, we need to move forward in tackling climate change with the perspectives of those who have been actively fighting against the impacts for the longest period. As Melissa said, we are the first people to face the impacts of climate change, and we have also been doing it for you know, the past 500 years since the, the beginning of colonialism, and we seeing, and seeing the, the landscape shift and change so much due to extraction um, at the hands of colonizers. Those who have the intimate connection with the land those who are land-based peoples are the ones that need to be leading these movements. And you can't, you can't say that you're doing uh, the world justice or investing in, in clean futures when you have blood on your hands from projects like this, where you're defiling graves, where you're killing countless relatives um, and using a relative to do that, which is part of what makes it really hard for me to think of too, is like the river, you know, that, that is a relative to the Inu people. I'm sure just as much as the Penobscot River is a relative for us. And to see that happen is, is really devastating. And so those who have the intimate connection with the land are the ones that need to be leading, as I said. And we cannot beat climate change. And these, these lingering effects that we're gonna see for the next you know, decades and decades, even if we made the full transition right now away from, from, um, from fossil fuels, we can't, we can't, we can't envision this future without indigenous peoples leading. And I, again, I just really wanna say thank you to Melissa and thank you to all of those who um, have a part in, in organizing this talk today and to all of you who are listening. Um, yeah, could you really let me? Um, thank you so much, Lakota and Melissa, for sharing your stories. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Audrey Huffnagel, and I work for, with Maine Youth for Climate Justice. So now that you have heard these stories from these amazing speakers, you're probably wondering what you can do to help stop the CMP corridor and Mega Dam hydropower. So there are several ways that you can take action and get involved. Um, first of all, you can join the Sierra Club action team um, and there's a link in the in the slide um, and you can you can use that to learn more and to join um, also youth so anyone under the age of 30 can join Maine youth for climate justice's energy campaigns team um, which is working on this effort and you can email um, the mycj email which is also in the slide um, you can also join 350 Maine's CMP Opposition Working Group by emailing info at 350maine.org. And you can learn more about this issue from the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance um, at the link in the slide, which all those links will also be put in the chat. So, um, 
so for the calls to action, um, so you can contact your representatives, um, both in Maine and Massachusetts, to let them know that you oppose this project and Canadian hydropower, um, and ask them to support a just transition to um, clean energy. You can also write an LTE or an op-ed, um, and we've put together an, an LTE guide, um, which can be maybe screen shared, um, but it has, it has some tips about writing letters to the editor um, and an overview of the CMP corridor and of Mega Dam hydropower and that, that issue. And it walks you through talking points, how to submit, and also includes a bunch of resources. Um, if you get an LTE or an op-ed published, email info at 350main.org or tag at 350main on social media. And the first two people to get LTEs or op-eds published and to let 350 Main know will get a signed copy of the book Arctic Blue Deserts, Flattening the Arctic's Pulse by Stefan Kasperzak, which is about how Megadam hydropower creates unchecked heat pollution and contributes to the climate crisis. Um, also, you can attend the upcoming Maine De um, Department of Environmental Protection public hearing which is October 19th. Um, there's one session starting at 9 a.m. and the other section is at 5.30 p.m. And it's about suspending the license for the CMP corridor um, to use land in Maine after a recent um, Superior Court decision which challenged the license. Um, and that's open to the public. Um, there should be a link in the chat um, to if you want to um, speak there and you can also learn more at that link. Um, and also Maine Youth for Climate Justice asks Maine voters to vote yes on question one, um, which is a citizens referendum that would um, stop the CMP corridor. And that will be on the ballot on November 2nd, um, which is the election this year. And you, there will be a link in the chat where you can learn more. So now I will um, pass it back to Julia to introduce the Q&A. So I'm going to hand um, the Q&A over to our moderator, Cassie. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will start answering your questions. So much, Julia. Um, yeah, so I think there were some questions already asked in the chat that had been answered. Um, but one was specific um, to the Penobscot River, so Lakota. I'm wondering if you wanted to expand on that. Um, someone asked, um, with the context that there are so many projects going on, like line three and line five all over the world. In Minnesota, the tribes gave their wild rice personhood and are using it in tribal court against Enbridge. So they're wondering, could rights to the river be established like this in Maine and give the river personhood? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, in Maine, the Penobscot River is a census member, I believe, of, of the nation. And so we, we recognize the personhood of the river. That's a process that was began uh, some years ago and yeah, our, our hope is that um, in this case with the state of Maine and the, the illegal seizure, illegal even by the means of, of the colonial uh, court systems, um, we're hoping that the Supreme Court of the United States will hear our petition to that uh, ruling that took place. Um, we've been in this fight for you know, almost a decade now. Um, and yeah, I mean, that is that is one angle and that's something that we, we had already previously been working on. And, you know, we, we're we're still fighting and still hoping that, you know, even in the system that that is based in, in upholding certain power dynamics, that their laws themselves will be respected. But yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Lakota. Um, the next question. Um, I'll include the whole question says, if there were no electricity demand, there would be no need for imported energy. 
Closing down the traditional coal and nuclear power stations, polluting locally, creates the demand now preferentially for clean power, polluting outside our borders. So how to solve this conundrum? All energy producing technologies create waste and pollution. Should we maybe instead just reduce our energy and material intensive lifestyle followed by reducing our numbers? Um, who wants to take that? All three of you can too. We also have Julian from the North American um, Megadam Resistance Alliance joining to answer any questions related to their work. So anyone can take that. I can also repeat the question too. Um, I can try to answer that. Thanks for that question. Um, let me not answer it, but I think energy efficiency and reducing demand is certainly a part of the equation when it comes to how we think about clean energy um, or green energy. Um, so yeah, that's a, a great question and obviously quite a big one too and, and how we do that. And you know, I don't have the answer with regards to how we do that, but um, we definitely believe that that efficiency um, and overall reduction of demand is really important um, when it comes to kind of the holistic, you know, equation of how do we transition over to clean energy and like adjust um, in meaningful and considerate way. So not sure if that answered that, but thanks for that question. Thanks, Julian. Um, Lakota or Melissa, do you want to speak to that question at all? No worries if not. I think I have all the information for that one. So I think I'll pass on that one, thanks. Okay, cool. Wait, um, on, on one point on that, um, yeah. where it says reducing our numbers, um, I do hope that that doesn't imply some kind of like population narrative, um, just because I, I really want to to um, give some space for that, where there's a false narrative around this myth of overpopulation um, being like a driver of climate change or something that we need to address immediately when really what we have is an, a uh, system that's built on overproduction and uh, the extraction of resources in mass. And it, it's just based in so much waste. And so it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with reducing our numbers. Um, it has more to do with building systems that are sustainable because we have the ability to do so. We have actually way more resources than we could ever possibly need as a species. Um, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I know that it starts with getting permission and um, cons consulting and working with indigenous peoples in those areas. Yeah, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Um, someone else is wondering what other states are receiving um, mega dam power from Hydro Quebec. I don't know, Julian, if you want to take that, or someone else wants to jump in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the answer is it's a bit complicated because of how. So I'll, I'll just speak for New England, but um, how energy distribution goes in New England, and obviously it's a mixed portfolio of um, fossil fuels um renewables and hydro um so but other states um new york is is a big one um and i'm not sure if anyone has heard but um the champlain hudson power express it's also known as chippy is a proposed transmission corridor that would go under the hudson river um causing detrimental environmental impacts um and that would also bring canadian hydropower uh to new york um vermont receives a lot of their power um and they're one of the, you know, a state that considers um, hydropower or large mega dam hydropower um, renewable, which not a lot of states actually do. Um, or I might be the only one as of right now. Other states are trying to change that. Um, and yeah, of course, Massachusetts, Maine receives some. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, you know, most states in New England at least are, are receiving some amount of hydropower from Quebec. Thanks, Julian. Um, this question, yeah, Amy makes a good point in the chat that we do really need to organize regionally. And we hope that this, this webinar is a good starting point for continuing the regional work. Um, so 
someone else asked, what impact could PTP, the main consumer owned utility, have on the corridor? Um, Lakota, do you want to take that? Or? I wish I had a good answer for that question. Um, my hope is that since it would be consumer owned and since the project is so uh, opposed by the main public that other means would, would happen as a result. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'm not an expert on, on the consumer owned utilities uh, bill or um, you know what, what kind of mitigation could happen as a result of that. But I think that that would definitely be a preferred model, especially when CMP is again, the worst rated um, consumer, uh, what's the word? <laughs> They're the worst rated company that's based in utilities in the United States for three years in a row. So I'm pretty sure the public would be able to be, uh, you know, more reliable than that, hopefully. Thanks, Lucetta. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I'm going to throw in the chat for anyone who's interested um, the link to our power main. They're the, the group working on pushing for a consumer owned utility in Maine. Um, and then another question I think that we got earlier is not as related to hydro, but more on um, you know greenwashed renewable energy solutions. Um, Melissa, I'm going to throw this to you because I know you're working on um, solar in. Um, your community, but someone is curious about power market um, and they keep getting mailings from them to sign up for clean energy produced at solar farms throughout Maine, particularly the farm in China, Maine. And they think it seems like a good idea, but they're cautious if there's a downside to this business model. Any thoughts or opinions about this or solar? So I think you're muted, Melissa. Oh, can you hear me now? Is that is that okay? Can you hear me? All right, sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, it's kind of a tricky one, right? I mean, I keep getting mailings from them to sign up for clean energy and I get those same, very same, <laughs> same uh, mailings. But what, you know, what our problem is, is when we think about solar, solar farms, you know, there are places other than destroying an entire region, you know, acres and hundreds of acres of pine barren. So I guess, I mean, that's a tough question. It, what's it involved? What are they trying to do? Is the power market good or not? I mean, it all depends on where they're trying to put the solar power. So I guess that's, that's kind of a, I don't know, that's a tough question all in all, but all I can say is for us, um, we're not opposed to maybe solar power if it was on um, on buildings or or other areas that don't graze over and, and destroy an entire forest and all the habitat that lives there. So yeah, there is a downside to that model depending on who's who's doing it and what they're doing with it, I guess, so to speak. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. It's a tough one. Yeah, I just want to jump, jump in there quick and I think, you know, I don't know anything about um, power market or what we're referring to specifically here, but I think more generally we need to know more about where our energy is coming from and we need to, to think critically about where our energy is coming from. I think that's one of, I hope everyone is taking that as a key takeaway from this conversation um, and that just because energy is renewable, it does not mean that it is necessarily good. So. I hope that we can all walk away from this thinking about you know where, when we turn the lights on, um, where does that energy come from? Thanks, Julia. Um, let's see, I've gotten one more question and this person is asking, is there any hydropower that is considered clean, green or renewable? Um, I don't know, Julian, if you want to take that, or all three of you can jump in where you see fit. 
Um, sure, I can try to answer that. Um, it's that's a hard question. Um, it it depends a lot on the communities impacted. Um, you know, it, it oftentimes as um, Lakota and Melissa were talking about when you know these dams, a lot of dams and, and hydro projects were created, um, and their locations and um, impacts were were intentional um, and harmed and actively harm um, indigenous communities. So you know it's it's hard to answer that, but you know as far as environmental impacts go and it impacts the ecosystems, I mean, dam all dams have really detrimental impacts on um, on ecosystems, on rivers, um, on land downstream. Um, and on communities ultimately. So um, again, that's, you know, it's a question that, you know, can be a, a bit subjective depending on um, the communities impacted and all that. But but overall, um, hydropower almost always has a, a some type of negative impact on, you know, either human rights, communities, um, or the environment, of course. Yeah. And Lakota or Melissa, do you want to jump into? I know Lakota, you were speaking to your experience with dams near your community as well. Yeah, I feel kind of um, what Julian said makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's no matter no matter what kind of um, energy extraction you're going to be doing from the land, there's going to be some kind of negative impacts, right? Um, it's just all about kind of keeping this this idea of reciprocity and balance and understanding how when you Im implement one kind of change in an ecosystem that's going to reverberate across all of the other elements of that ecosystem um, since life is you know it's a web we're all interconnected um, so yeah I think there's always going to be some some kind of um, negative consequences, but that's for any kind of energy we have. It's all about finding the ones that are the most mitigating. Um, yeah. Awesome. Melissa, do you want to jump in? No pressure. I think you're muted. I'm sorry, I had to walk out for just a moment. I had the grandson who came in on me. Which question are we at? I'm very sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Um, sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, the question is, do you think there's any hydropower that could be considered clean, green, or renewable? Oh, I mean, that's a loaded question because generally it's tearing through some sort of land, water source or other. So that's difficult for me to answer as an indigenous person because we know what the results are. So could it be? I mean, I don't know. Um, it's, it seems to me that so far, it really hasn't done much, much good for people if it's, if it's ruining our water source and our food sources. So, I mean, I don't know. That's another one of those kind of hard questions. Right. We want renewable energy. We want to save the climate. We want to do what's right. But at the same time, at what cost? Right. So I would think our, our Innu friends would not agree and would say, no, there isn't because of what, the, what they've lost. So I would certainly want to sit on that side more so than the other. I think we are opposed to it because it is going to, no matter how you look at it, it doesn't go through you know, so the, the wealthy neighborhoods that would generally probably go through an indigenous neighborhood <laughs> or on through our land. So I would say that's, that's a tough one to give a yes or no to, but at this point I would lean toward the other side, obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to reemphasize, um, we are recommending at least many for climate justices for question one in Maine, vote yes to reject the corridor. It's got funny language. You have to vote yes to reject something, but that's the referendum question. Um, and then another question I saw is someone is wondering if the dam construction in Quebec is completed. Um, Julian, do you want to take that one or Lakota? Sorry, I went. You went off. Saw that you went off mute. 
that no it's okay know. if they mean like the the mega dam the churchill falls mega dam like yeah i'm fairly certain that's been completed it's not in quebec it's in um La it's in labrador correct julian yeah, yeah. that's correct um, yeah um so yeah and with that project um so uh, hydro quebec um also there's also now core energy which is in labrador newfoundland um and they do feed power down to quebec um hence we might get some of that power um so there's also a proposed project which is um I, I believe, um, so there was Muskrat Falls, um, the Muskrat Falls Mega Dam in Newfoundland, Labrador, and construction hasn't started on another possible project, which is known as Gull Island, um, but there is heavy concern um, that, you know, construction might be started on that, and that would actually be an even bigger dam, um, size-wise, megawatt, um, you know, generating capacity-wise, um, than Muskrat Falls, and Muskrat Falls was, was Quite large and has really detrimental impacts and there's heavy resistance in, in communities there. Um, as far as Quebec goes, um, yeah, it's right now that as far as I know, there aren't any active construction projects. Um, however, there is um, data that, you know, we've gathered and, and worked on that kind of points to with all of Hydro-Quebec's exports um, and their commitments, be that to Massachusetts, to New York um, and other states and just to the province, um, they might not be able to meet that demand. And that would mean either falling back on the fossil fuels um, to meet part of that, which obviously is not um, at all what, what needs to happen right now, um, or additional dam construction would absolutely be necessary to meet um, demand. So hope that answers that. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, um, but Lakota and Melissa, is there anything else you want to say or promote or anything like that? We've got a little bit of extra time. Um, oh, okay, sorry, we have one more question. It just went into the chat, so I'll ask that. Um, the question is, is Hydro-Quebec currently selling all the power they produce? And if so, then why do they want to send any to Massachusetts? Do they want to flood increased acreage? I don't know who wants to take that. Um, I can I can try to start answering that. Um, so I'm just reading it again. Um, so they a lot of the power obviously goes to um, ratepayers or, or users in Quebec. Um, but, but they do make a lot of money off of exports. So, um, I mean, just the CMP quarter alone over um, a period of time would bring in billions of dollars in revenues for them. Um, so it's, um, as far as them wanting to flood increased acreage, I, you know, I, I can't answer that, but um, it's definitely, they would make a lot of money off of, um, they do make a lot of money off of exports, so. Yeah, Melissa or Lakota, do you want to jump in to add anything else? I mean, I, I think I can just add to it. I mean, as as he as you said, it, it's it's all about money, right? It it always comes down to who's going to make the most money. So I don't necessarily know all the details of this, you know, this proposed, but I do know that you know Massachusetts calls calls Hydro Quebec New England's clean energy partner, and and we it, it's all about the money. So I, I don't know exactly how to answer that question and what, what the benefits would they think would be. But as I said, it, it's no benefit if it's tearing through the land. So yeah, and Julian, I'm, I'm sorry. Lakota might have more on that. Yeah, um, I um, now we're getting a bunch of new questions, but I'll circle back to those. Um, someone also asked, do we want to remove existing dams and corridors or just prevent new construction? Pretty open-ended question, so I'll let anyone jump in. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like it depends on which dam it is. Um, as I said, there were four dams on the Kennebec. Uh, there's actually more dams than that. I think there might be a total of six, but there's four dams on the Kennebec that are producing negligible, uh, negligible amounts of energy. Um, and uh, as I said in, in my piece, like they are devastating um, not only Atlantic salmon, but all of the other species that relied on Atlantic salmon um, as a part of their diet. Um, you know, everything being interconnected, right? And so, yeah, there certainly are existing dams. I mean, there's even the dam, the dams on the Penobscot River, which are, are damaging our ability to, to fish sustainably if the water wasn't so polluted. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it really depends. It's a case by case basis. I mean, who's benefiting from the energy, who's benefiting from the dams, who's benefiting from the corridors? Is it native people or is it everyone at the expense of native people? Um, so, yeah, that's what I have. Well, sir, Julian, anything to add to that? No worries if not. Um, that, that, that was great. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, ideally, um, removing dams would be great because, um, you know, as everyone's said, you know, they, they do have really, um, detrimental impacts on communities, on ecosystems, on the climate. Um, and, and worldwide, um, you know, 60% of the world's rivers are, are fragmented by dams, reservoirs, um, and those types of projects. Um, and rivers play a really important role, obviously, in ecosystems for communities, for carbon sequestration, um, for a bunch of, of different things. So restoring those rivers and those ecosystems absolutely um, should be a priority. Yeah, I think just to jump in, like you see in Maine and Massachusetts, a lot of groups oftentimes they're very um, white led kind of championing dam removal work in the United States and saying, we must do this. And then on the flip side saying, you know, supporting the corridor in these projects and not thinking about where the energy is coming from. Um, so I think that's one way to think of it too. Like if you want to see a dam removed in your community or your state, like then the dam should be removed, even if they're already existing in other communities where the energy could be imported from. Um, yeah, I think another question, um, it's kind of related to this, but there, this person is wondering if there's a role for smaller mid-sized water power sources using abandoned Ways, sorry, I don't know if I pronounced that right, and mill races that do not go all the way across the waterway, of which there are a lot of in Massachusetts. I don't know if anyone has any experience or thoughts on that. Um, well, so I think you're muted if you're trying to answer this. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was just kind of reading it out loud to myself. I don't know. Is answer that question. That's a, another tough one. Is there a role for small and sun? That's tricky. I don't know if somebody with more experience on that may be able to answer that question. I don't have. Yeah. It's a good really question. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if either of you have any thoughts. Kind of a big question, a lot of big questions tonight. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm not seeing any other questions and I know we're 10 minutes away from the end of the event. Um, so thank you everyone for sending in your questions. Thank you Lakota and Melissa for speaking and Julian jumping in to answer some more of those uh, North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance related questions. Um, again, Lakota and Melissa, if there's anything you want to promote or um, add, feel free to jump in. Um, and then we can wrap up. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. And I think it's just important, as we said, you know, for these companies, organizations, and people, just to remember who, who's in your region and 
think it's, you know, there's a lot to learn in this, this whole area. It's, you know, myself, I, I, I don't come from an experience in, you know, a lot of this environmental work. I'm, I've been, you know, trained with the Indigenous knowledge, and I know a lot about those things. So there's really a lot to take in and a lot to learn. And there's a lot of unanswered questions, as I said in my comment earlier. So every day is a new opportunity to learn and educate ourselves. And I do, um, I saw someone made a comment about the blue deserts. Um, someone was really great, gifted me both those books. So I do recommend those too. So thank you. Yeah, and I also wanted to say thank you so much. Um, it's really, it's really good to be here, and I'm really glad that that more environmentally based groups are are seeking out indigenous folks to, you know, share in our experiences and to talk about um, how these things are impacting us and kind of more creative, um, long lasting solutions to mitigate climate change and the impacts that are happening. Um, it means a lot and I hope to see more of this in the future for sure and more folks from other communities as well um, you know who, who can be on to, to share in their experience so thank you so much for you know putting this on everyone who's been involved in this it's been great yeah thank you both all right Julia I'll pass it back to you yeah, so I, I just want to thank you all so much again for, for taking some time out of your night and joining us tonight. Um, I encourage you all to stay involved, to bring this conversation back to your community, to the organizations that you work with. I hope that we all can keep having these critical and sometimes complicated conversations about energy and environmental justice and really considering the, the full impacts um, of our energy use, especially on indigenous communities, as well as the climate and the environment. Um, there's gonna be a follow-up email sent tonight with resources to all attendees. And we're gonna share this recording with you all as well. And I just wanna thank you again so much to our speakers, Lakota and Melissa, um, for really taking the time to, to share everything with us. And again, thank you to our organizers, Maine Youth for Climate Justice, 350 Maine, the Sierra Club Maine Chapter, and NAMRA, as well as all of the sponsors um, that jumped on to, to help support this event tonight. And yeah, we, we hope to, to keep, keep this conversation going and stop this corridor and end these energy um, projects from big hydroelectric dams. So thank you all, and we'll, we'll hope to see you all soon. Kapitash. Thank you again.